when an actor that really understands his character applies movement, aggression, and emotion behind the movement, um, it just feels better. It feels different. It feels there's so much more. It's it's so much more uh, richness to it, and um, it could be a haymaker. But the way Tom Cruise or Henry Cavill throws the haymaker makes a big difference to me, and I can feel that emotion. I can feel the intention a little bit more, and that is what I look for. Even if it's a training segment, like something in Dune, you know, there's a, that, that, that training segment with, um, what's his name, Berlin and um, Timothy Chalamet. The rhythm and the lesson that his instructor is teaching him, there's so much more applied to it than just some Kali movements. There's the way that they're applying the movements, the, the rhythm, the conversation that they're having. When it's done in that way, um, I'm just taken aback and I'm inspired all over again. I'm inspired all over again. And the thing I've done is I've actually taken that mentality and I've gone back to like 1985 or 1983 and watched Wheels on Mills and I watched Benny and Jackie go at it. And I'm like, they were doing it. They were doing it. And that's what I, that's what moved me back then. I may not have known it. I may have thought it was that rolling kip up and then knocking, you know, blowing the candles out with a kick, all those spectacle things. It's not, it wasn't, I don't think it was. I think it was the way that they performed. The energy that they poured, that they put, the emotion they put, Bruce, he's got charisma in everything he does. So it really comes back to telling the story. It really comes back to understanding the character's motivations. And I know that sounds like actor studio type stuff, but man, it really is effective for me as a viewing, as a viewer. Um, and that's kind of my, that's my number one thing when I watch action. This week on Action Talks, I'm talking to Ken Kitagua. Ken got his start in the indie action world working with Zero Gravity and later with Bao Tran on films like The Challenge and The Paper Tigers. We talk all about his unique style of movement and choreography. Um, I have to admit, Ken, I'm a big fan of you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean Enjoy. that. And uh, so it, this is like a... I think that this is a special interview because like we're sort of like we're contemporaries we're you know yeah. we're kind of coming up from the same you know mindset the same place you know Bay Area Bay Area not originally yeah. in the Bay Area but you know, I would love to know just uh, like where it all started for you and how did you piss off your parents oh yeah that's all that all lines up um well thank you uh, Eric I'm a fan of yours we, you know we've been we kind of came up together um uh just that independent energy that 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 source of inspiration sharing stuff with one another over the internet over the years um but uh before that uh i, I was uh, i'm born and raised in the pacific northwest um a, a little town called bremerton right right outside of seattle um during during the early days uh i would say a lot of my exposure came from my my father's fascination with bruce lee and so bruce lee became sort of a bonding thing with uh dad and, and myself and it kind of replaced saturday morning cartoons in a way it was like i I, didn't, I could care less about what was on tv i just wanted to keep popping in way of the dragon or enter the dragon I, in fact i watched it so much that i i think my, my parents had to replace the vhs a couple of times um enter, enter the dragon was officially eaten by our vhs um machine so um, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of absorbing that at a young age and that there wasn't a ton of material. You know, I didn't know how to ask for more. So I just kept repeating the same stuff. Um, eventually came across um, a couple of Jackie Chan films. And and then once they sort of like, once I started to pull the curtain back and, you know, he would reveal all the, the behind the scenes to end you know, during the credit sequence. I was like, oh, this is a thing. Like people, this is a process. It's not just... I used to think Bruce performed every time I put him in the, the VHS as a kid. I was like, oh, it's live. He's doing it again for me. Then you just kind of, you, you build uh, you build an understanding of, of like what's going on. And when I would watch Jackie uh, go through um, sort of, I was super fascinated by the end credit sequences because of the process. I was like, oh, there's, you learn this and then you try and try and try and try again. And that's kind of how it evolved into a fascination of like attempting it to myself, attempting it for myself. But I'd always been interested in the Chinese style because of Bruce. I always thought like if it was Kung Fu, then I would end up like Bruce Lee. So it was very surface. It was like, it's it's a Chinese style. I can't do Japanese. I can't do Taekwondo. It has to be 
kung fu. And so that was that was kind of the uh, the the early fascination. Um, and uh, over the years, again, like watching Jackie and and kind of like peeling back the layers of of creative process and trying to discover that for myself. Um, that's when you know I discovered the the family camcorder as well and tore up the backyard, tore up the living room. I mean, my mom would come home from work and all the furniture would be out in the front yard because we needed to clear out the living room for a fight scene. And that's hard to explain to, you know, my mom, like, like, what, what are you, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> like, why aren't you doing homework, first of all? And then what is this that you're doing with the camera and all these guys sweating in my, in my living room? And so it was a lot of that over the years. And over time, I think they just accepted that this is, they'd rather have me doing this than out, you know, out in the, sh you know, drinking on Friday night with, you know, with, with the, the rest of the kids uh, from school. So, or whatever else that you can get into in a small town um that kind of kept me busy and and that was my creative outlet and eventually um funny thing is, is the reason why i got to the bay from from seattle is because i actually wanted to go to film school um and the academy of art uh, which is which is based in san francisco um offered a program called uh new media which combined like graphic design um, web design video editing, a little bit of special effects, audio design. So I had everything in there to kind of like comfort mom and dad. Like there could be a job after this, you know, all this all this money we spend on your higher education. But at the same time, I was sneaking away and making short films. And that's how I came across Tony Chu and Larry Leong and Latif Crowder and Sam Locke and that whole ZG North uh, team kind of formed. And, you know, one thing led to another and I, I'm, I'm in an alleyway in San Leandro making title pending two with some of these dudes that I was just watching on the internet a year before. So it kind of just happened, you know, just like you angle your sights and you kind of open yourself up to that frequency. It's just, it just started to just fall and fall in line with a lot of the guys that were doing stuff up there. It's a damn shame that we never had a, had a chance to, to cross hands, you know, in, on screen, but you never know. I mean, I'm just, I still got, I still got some, <laughs> I, know I still got do. that energy in me, man. I, I still know, I know you do. I've stuff. seen you. I've yeah. seen you. Uh, go go back just a second to when you mm -hmm. were tearing up your living room and making fight scenes. So you were watching Jackie's process. What did you take from that in these first efforts to make, you know, your own action scenes in your living room? I think the thing I noticed was the way that the, the segmented style of, of the way he shot things. And I was like, oh, they're broken up. Like you can be dope in like a three hit combo and just refine that sharpen that and make that look the best you can versus like i think the way i saw bruce was just stand back all out performer and i thought you had to be good all the way through like i just didn't know how it worked but when i saw jackie breaking things down it kind of gave me a sense of like oh this is doable like we could we could break things down into bite-sized chunks and string them together even though back then we didn't really have uh editing uh software or anything like that we were all doing in camera but that also uh pushed us to practice more and to to kind of like learn how those things are framed and now don't get me wrong like nothing we shot in the in the mid late 90s looked anything like dragons forever but i think it was the idea that we were putting together story through movement and like how that all kind of blended together was sort of that was the aha moment of i want to keep for trying to figure this out i want to try to i want to keep you know teasing at like like how do how do they make it look so fluid? How like and 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 again, eventually you you understand like cutting styles and you you get into like really get in the weeds with trying to try to understand different director styles and and just the way movements work um, on screen and composition and all those things. But it was ultimately like watching how Jackie broke things down. It was it was a way that was was digestible for me at that age to see movement yeah. and not really have to hear somebody teach me how to make movies. You know what I mean? Like by watching just, just by example. So, so you, were you doing martial arts at the time then? And, you know, talk yeah. about how you got into doing martial arts and what it was and then how that dovetailed into filmmaking or vice versa. I mean, right. a, lot of the time we, a lot of the time we get into martial arts so that we can look good on camera, but that was just me. No, no. Um, it was very similar because I had this fascination with, you know, like Bruce's charisma and just like that hero, heroic, just that pre presentation of, of Bruce. And I, I always knew that there's something about the martial arts. I, I loved watching movement. I was always fascinated with, I mean, it didn't have to be martial arts. I mean, it could be like a really amazing 
a circus act or a juggler or, or a skateboarder. And I was always fascinated with how people controlled their body. But martial arts was always kind of like, that was my thing. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in skate. Like that was my movement style. It spoke to me. So again, going back to um, the Chinese style, the Kung Fu style, there was a, there was one Shaolin Kung Fu school in my, um, in my town. Um, and I'm so grateful to have come across um, that group of people and my Sifu. Um, to this day, I still hold hold those memories, though, even though it was a few, like it was only like four or five short years. But when you're, you know, uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, like a early teen, uh, you know, just kind of like working your way through high school. That's that's your world. Those are your people. And, and you know, my Sifu was like a second father and you spent all your time at the training hall. You spent all your time prepping for tournaments, doing, you know, all your time prepping for lion dance, you know, um, whatever it was that we were working on, that's all I was focused on. But because you have a group of guys that were like-minded and they were interested in, in martial arts and especially Kung Fu. And I kind of introduced my friends to, you know, the Jackie, the Samos, the Yimbus and the Yindu Pings. And after showing them and, and you know, them getting, you know, uh, that, that spark lit, um we created our own team and we, we we started developing our own you know our own short films um and uh just kind of going back um the style that i studied was uh, uh shaolin long fist and um white crane so that's a lot of the stuff i do even in to this day even the paper tigers a lot of that is rooted in those early years of, of training uh you know some of the kicks some of the segments some of the the movement patterns were from long fist and a lot of the trapping a lot of the hand forms are coming from my white crane training. So I didn't create anything new. Like a lot of that was just stored in the back of my head. And it was just kind of kind of working through the scripts and, and kind of trying to just feel out like what is my natural response to these things if yeah. if it's supposed to be rooted in a you know in a kung fu system or family yeah. system. When you were uh you, know, you said you did lion dancing, what was the mm-hmm. How did how was that framed to you from the seafood? Like, did he say this is going to be this is just something that we do? Was it did he say this is going to bring rain this year? Like how did he frame that to get you guys like to do the lion dance properly? Yeah, yeah. Um it's interesting because my my seafood didn't do lion. He learned it on his own, which is odd. Like it was a really strange thing. Like he learned it on his own. I learned I found these things out a little later after leaving the academy and and kind of moving on. Um, he learned it himself because uh, they didn't do it at his at his school. Um, and my Sifu just he was so fascinated with the martial arts culture, the Chinese culture. He he brought in all these different. He's an he's a I don't know what you would call it. He's an official acupuncturist. Uh, you know, like he went way deep into the he you he knows Mandarin and all that stuff. He's a white guy. Um, oh, so he's not Chinese. But, that makes sense. no. He's not Chinese. Now so, it's impressive. So, <laughs> now it's impressive it's, in fact it's like fact, so what said, oh okay yeah 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 right right um so okay. he's, a, he's, a, he's a white man born and raised in the pacific northwest and found kung fu when he went to um college on the east coast brought back all this stuff to the hometown and and by the time he was um sifu ranked sifu he opened up a school in the, you know in the pacific northwest and when it comes to those things like the lion dance like we just accepted it we were just like oh this is Chinese culture like this is stuff that we're supposed to be learning so that we could be a better well-rounded martial artist and, you know you just do these things and you you learn and you appreciate the culture that all this is rooted in and coming from um it never got any further than that it just I was I played the tail um mm-hmm. I still feel my back pain you know to this day from all the parades and stuff that we did but um I had I a great ask time you doing too, it. like it was there did you find that lion dancing then worked back into martial arts somehow like what did you take from it it was stance work all day it was just like it was moving down the street and horse dance bent over all day just like i had such good stances back when i was a teen because it's just all i did was fundamental movements like that those stepping patterns and um you know especially when you're in the back like all you can do is focus on your feet and follow you know kind of get you're getting glimpses of the movement and the patterns that were moving down the street and it was all stance work. So it all, it all worked into, um, hmm. into my form. Were there uh, other, um, were there other lion dancing schools at these events that you would go to, or was it just, you there was, doing? yeah, across the, across the, the sound, um, there were a couple of trolley foot, um, schools, uh, in Seattle, uh, but we never mingled. We never, we saw them and they were, they had their own part in the parade and we had a little piece and, you know, we were spread apart enough, but, um, 
I always knew we were kind of like a, almost like a misfit lion dance team because it wasn't like my, again, my Sifu wasn't like this traditional Southern style buttoned up, you know, showing up and had his whole team behind him. We were just kind of like, it's kind of like a cool hippie that was really good at Kung Fu and loved the Chinese culture. And it was like, this is my team. <laughs> and we're doing, we learned that we learned this, this style of lion dance. And um, we were invited out to these parades and we, we, we did a pretty good job, I think. Yeah. I mean, even when I watch some of the footage um, on VHS, when I go back home every once in a while, I was like, ah, that's pretty good. Like, that's pretty good for not really knowing where this is all rooted and just kind of following movement and just taking it for what it was surface. Well, you know, it's a cool story. He's kind of a microcosm or a macro. I mean, he's, you know, he's kind of your, he's your Sifu, obviously, but he's sort of yeah. like, it's also like misplaced dude that's like, I, I love this culture. I want to adopt this thing and figure it out and live it and see where it takes me yeah, that's perfectly said that that exactly that's exactly what represent like when i think back to him and you put it all together as an adult and you're like oh this dude was just really really into is just in love with kung fu and everything that kind of branched out from that fascination he absorbed and really cool dude really interesting man i'm still i still fear and respect him to this day <laughs> like you know like i'm older than he was when he was teaching me it's kind of a weird thing to do when you kind of do those that math um and you start to think about all the people that influenced you inspired you and but yeah he was a really really amazing um teacher so you go down to um the bay area you go to uh, academy of art uh what mm -hmm. was what was filmmaking digital filmmaking like back then oh man um what do you call it? It was, it was a mini DV. I think that was the format that we were shooting on back then. It was a lot of logging and capturing. Um, it was, it was, it was a nightmare if you were not organized. Um, uh, you couldn't get by if you were disorganized. That was one thing for sure. Today, I feel like you can upload some footage, just kind of hack some stuff together and then spit it out and get some likes and, and keep moving. But th back then there was a little bit more in touch with like, I don't want to make it seem like there, there we were like we had it was like a, like a craft or anything but like there was a lot more detail there was a lot more detail oriented in process back then it felt like um uploading stuff to i know um some of my friends that were actually in the film department cut film um they they i think it was the avi um one of these these editing decks i, I think that was what it was called but it was just, it was all these monstrous machines and all this tech that I had no idea how it all worked. And it was quite daunting to see all that at once. Um, uh, but but mini DV is kind of the medium that I worked on and started with. Um, and thanks to the Mac and thanks to, you know, like uh, the Firewire that made life easier once I got to the Academy and I started to understand like, you know, they started to like make some advancements with tech. Um, around about that time, the G4 kind of came came out around that time. The mm -hmm. IMAX came out, you know, all that stuff. So, I was I was always kind of an Apple a Mac user back then because it was easy. I didn't get computers. I didn't understand any of that stuff. Here I am today working at a a tech company. I still barely understand how to use my laptop. <laughs> well, we'll we'll get we'll get to that definitely. I wanna, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get into that stuff. Uh, so talk about talk about working with Zero Gravity. You did title pending mm -hmm. too. Talk about the process. Like, what? How did you guys shoot? Uh, like, you guys get together in the morning and you know meet up, eat some uh, Cliff bars, and go at it. Like, how did it work? And coming yeah. up with choreography and the whole, the whole process. For sure. Like, I think when I got to um, to SF, I just wanted to find a group of guys that were doing something similar to what I thought I was the only one doing back up in in Washington State. You know, I thought we were a pretty unique group of people. I came down and um, there was a there was a site called belong belong.com and it was a bunch of tricking and it was just like I was like what is this this doesn't this is sort of like kung fu like it's a little bit like wushu and then there's some wild stuff going on with gymnastics so I found belong when I got to you know the computer labs back in the day and kind of just browsing around not doing homework just distracting myself with other stuff um, and I came across title pending one and i was like oh my god like these guys did it like they did what we've been trying to do they're doing stunts they got rhythm in the choreography they got a, a techno track in the background like this is everything i want to do <laughs> so i cold emailed tony chu 
And um, I, I went to their site, it was like, is there whatever it was back then. And, and um, just, I think they were, they had, they were, they were doing an open audition call. And so I was like, hey, this, this sounds like something I, I might be able to offer. I, have got, I got some martial arts training background and like filmmaking. So I just, just tried, reached out to Tony. He told me to come out to this place called um, Olympic, what is it called? Golden Gate Gymnastics up in Concord. Um, uh, so I took the BART up there, met with the team. Tony was like, you got some good potential. Come back next weekend. I was like, did I make it? Did I not make it? <laughs> so I kept going to these open practices and just kind of working out with them. And so I guess they were kind of checking out to see what I was capable of doing. And over time, it just we just became friends. And the more he talked, the more we realized that we had all these things in common in terms of our fascination with Hong Kong cinema and martial arts. And the one thing that I learned from them was, um, not, I wouldn't say I learned, but that exposed me. It was just the, the vast, uh, um, just how deep that category went. Because I was like, I knew Yin Biu, Samu Hung, and Jackie. And then they were like, dude, let's go to Chinatown, or you should go to Chinatown and just pull out some of these names. And, you know, that's how I, you know, I didn't learn about the Shaw Brothers until I was in my late teens, early 20s. And, you know, all of that other, all that other stuff, they exposed me to so much stuff early on. And I realized that a lot of the stuff that we were doing in practice was just trying stuff that we saw on VCD or in DVD back in the day, right? It was just trying to mimic things like recreate you know, whether it was a Dragon's Forever fight scene or just kind of like, you know, sort of a rhythm style from a Shaw Brother movie. A lot of that stuff was just copying just to kind of practice. Like they've already put into play a rhythmic, you know, kind of attention and, and um, attention to detail and that worked. Let's just, let's just do that. Just like as a musician would learn something that's already been written. Like, you know, don't go try and <laughs> write a new, you know, uh, you know, a new, a new song, just, play something or do something that appeals to you. Cause then it was more enjoyable. Cause then we were creating things that we, we admired. So um, Tony and the crew were, even though they were in, in, influenced by a lot of that stuff, there's he was, he and Larry and Latif were some of the most creative guys in terms of like controlling their body that I'd ever seen. Like I'd seen Capoeira on like on movies and like only the strong and, and things like that back in the day. But then I saw like Larry and Latif move. I was like, oh, this is, a, you could really do that. Like you could really spin <laughs> upside down like that. So the, it was so fascinating to see guys that had put the time in to learn how to get their body to move these ways. And that hooked me. I was like, I want to be around these guys all the time. I said, this is, these are the type of people I need to learn from because they, they applied the things that inspired them in a way. Like it was really, really fascinating to, to come across people like that early on um just super creative did uh so who uh, who was in charge of choreography or was it a collaborative process how did all that come together when you guys like or was it, was it planned ahead of time it was a collaborative process but um ultimately you know especially with like title pending two tony and larry kind of had like a rough outline of how they wanted things to go but when it came to the like kind of um I hate calling them fillers, but like when it came to like more of like kind of the back and forth the phrases, portion of the conversation, the phrases, right? That was more on us to kind of collaborate and just this is how I would respond and this is what I would do based on my body type and this and that. So it was never, they never forced a style on me, which was great because then I could kind of develop my own style as I was working through these, these projects with them. Um, so it was definitely collaborative. Um, uh, I found that I worked better with people that had similar training styles you know like it was difficult to come up with choreography with with larry despite loving the way he moved but i could work really well with sam Locke because he had a you know he had a sun Chao background and it was a kickboxing style i can i can understand the form a little bit better how to interact with it how to respond to it so yeah, yeah so you, did you find that um did you find that the rhythm was easier to follow or what I think it was that made it easier for you. I think it was rhythm, um, and just the way Capoeira was so like I didn't understand the movement. I didn't understand like you know how everything worked and the torque, and I wasn't sure where the the power was coming from. Um, but when I saw kickboxing and Thai boxing, you could relate very very simply because of the stand up nature of of you know the long fist style and the white crane style and bridging and and um, distance was a lot more um, apparent to me than with Capoeira, which is so evasive and 
can be kind of a tricky style. Um, so it was just, it was as, as simple as that. And then after that, uh, did you do Dam 3 after title pending too? Oh man, Dam 3. That was, I haven't thought about Dam 3 in a while. Yes, we did that um, maybe a year and a half, a year after title pending 2 was released. And that was so much fun now that I think about it. Like that one was fun because Larry spent a lot of time really um, kind of honing in on this this Hong Kong style, this 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 rhythm. Um, and even the stunts that, he, you know, he kind of, stunts and the cutting style that he put together. Hey, y'all want anything? To this day, that uh, the final fight of Dan Three was one of the, my my most proud, pride, proudful, prideful, proud moments in in doing anything um, action related because uh, it had really had that spirit. It had that Samo Jackie Yindu spirit. Um, God, that was God, over almost twenty years ago, I think. Something like yeah, that. That, that end fight is sort of like the epitome of how you can do a one on one on one fight. Yeah, like forever, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, damn three. You need another one. You need another damn there, uh, series. Were there, yeah. Were there any other uh, films that you were watching at the time that inspired your movement style, your choreography style, like new things that you were picking up in Chinatown, for example? Actually, one one that kind of hit home with me just because of, I don't want to say the emphasis of basics, but just how well executed and how aesthetically clean it was to me. Um, I found it through your um, forum for this from the stunt people forum called Angry Rangers uh, with I Ben Lau. Yeah, knew you'd say it. I I asked. Yeah. I hit you up about it. I remember. Yeah, way I remember back you hit then. me up. Yeah, and I was like, "What is this movie?" And I need more of it. And you you had posted some clips, and I would rewatch those things over and over again. Um, it was just something about the rhythm. It it, it wasn't Jackie doing it because I used to think that was Jackie. Jackie is the reason why it looks that way. And I go, oh, this is a thing. Like it's a, it's a style. It's a, it's a. There's a kickboxing rhythm to this, and there's a one, two. Like when I started watching more of those kinds of films, um, that's that's what actually helped me um, develop choreography for like Act of Revenge, for instance. Like that was a very hardcore, grounded style, and it was it was about um, rhythm, but broken rhythm as well. So um, yeah, Talk stuff like Act that. Revenge. Like, how did you? I mean. You, that's you and Sam. So yeah. you're fighting a guy that you're comfortable working with. Like what yeah. was the choreography process like for that? And also talk about, talk about how you're thinking about like, how does camera figure into this? How does editing figure into this as well? The, yeah. That's the reason why I created Act Revenge was, was kind of coming off of like damn three and title pending where um, as much as I admired the Tony and Larry style of choreography I wanted to do something that felt a little more hard hitting, a little darker, a little more like grounded and like believable, if you know. So Sam was the guy. I mean, anytime he was on screen, it looked like he could hurt you. Um, and he can hurt you. Like I I've I've even even through choreography, he he's got some uh some incredible power. So um yeah, no, that was the reason. And um, when we worked through choreography, it was very similar. I had the structure. I had kind of like the, the way that I wanted to structure the, the sequences. But ultimately, it came down to like giving Sam an opportunity to respond, you know, to the prompts. Right. And like just to see how he would react to this kind of aggression or these these type of movements. So um, a lot that the entire um, the entire short was a collaboration 50 50 down the middle between Sam and I. Um, and it was also an opportunity for me to practice editing. Honestly, I was like, I wanted to get back into that kind of like more locked off, uh, style of, of camera composition and, and, um, composing shots in a way that were a little bit more, uh, reminiscent of the eighties Hong Kong style, you know? So yeah. I didn't feel yeah. like we were doing much of that, um, with the M3 and TP2. Um, so again, like I just, I wanted to do something a little bit more rooted in, and, and that, that hard style, that, that kickboxing, just trying to take your head off with every swing kind of feel. So that's where that came from. 
What'd you guys shoot that on? Just out of curiosity. That was the DVX. That's right. The old the Panasonic DVX 24. That was the, was that the first one that was yeah doing 24 yeah. P yeah. The first prosumer one anyway. Yeah. Prosumer prosumer. One. Yeah. 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 That was a game changer for us. I remember looking at the footage after, you know, like a couple of takes and I was like, oh God, this is a movie. Yeah. This is a movie guys. Yeah. <laughs> we got our frame rate, right? Um, yeah. And never, and never yeah. again did the camera go above knee level. Never again. Did yeah, handle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. totally. We shot all of Everything Gondor sweeping. with that camera on the freaking floor. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, Rudy did some amazing stuff for you. You know, and the way he shot you, the, the the finale with you and Dennis. I just to this day, I can, I still see it. The way the camera moved through the set was just beautifully done. Beautifully done. Like, yeah, he was kind of up. you know he's. He's kind of like, I mean, that's he's like another stunt man where you say like, look, here's what I want to do. Um, here's my plan on this shot. What would you do? And he'd kind of look at it and he'd, and he'd do stuff like, I'm going to put a box right here just to give some parallax. Where it's like you can cross the camera in front. He'd always do that stuff, you know, just to like add aesthetic, you know. Yeah, he like, was... When I yeah I saw the, the first three things I saw you, you guys I think it was was it Stumpblade Alpha was the first time you worked with Reedy, or was that you was that was that not Stephen Reedy? Reedy was not involved in that. That's what got so him. He was, so we did undercut with him first. Just undercut. That was the first. Yeah. Okay. I don't think okay. he did Stumpblade with us. Okay. Well, either way, um, Reedy's Reedy's camera work was was brilliant back in the day. I remember watching this stuff like, oh my god, you guys. You guys took it to another level with the transitions and foreground, you know, objects. And still to, one of my favorite shots is you jumping through the van and a guy flying, like doing a sidekick, <laughs> a guy flies up. <laughs> like all that stuff was just brilliant to me. I was like, see, this is pushing it. This is pushing the boundaries and really thinking about the composition and the way the objects and the, and the performers work within the, within the scene. Um, that really pushed me. I don't know where it pushed me to and what happened after watching that over and over again, but it definitely opened me up to be like, let's consider all the elements. Let's consider everything that's going on in this. And, and then that's ultimately like, that's the Jackie style, you know, going back to like really understanding like the environment and how we can optimize everything in here and, and kind of give a really beautiful um, segmented, strung together picture. So just out yeah. of curiosity, Ken, when you were, when you were shooting and composing mm -hmm. Act of Revenge, um, like what do you what do you look at? Like what is it that makes you go, that's it? Like I got it. Like wh what is the aesthetic that you're looking for? Is it the composition composition of a shot? Is it the the timing? Is it moments? Is it impacts? What do you look for? To me, it's composition, um, especially being, you know, a, a designer, um, but trade it. It's like really understanding how the how the the performers occupy the frame, and where I want the, the attention to go to during those shots. If it's an impact shot, understanding where I want the eye to go so that it leads to the next shot, and just like how I'm trying to guide the eye around the frame. Um, I wish I could uh prove that that that's exactly in that and people could call that out and be like yeah that's the ken style it's always what i'm trying to do i don't know if i achieve it all the time but that's that's kind of how i i lead myself into composing shots and to kind of building out frames for, for action yeah it's composition rhythm to me um it's always it's it's great to get it as close as i can on the day but i also use editing to help finesse my my rhythm like if i need to close the gap on a couple of movements um i'll take care of that in editing even if i see it you know in playback or where i you know i can see things that i can fix later um and i don't worry too much about it as long as it was composed the way i, I intended if that makes sense and it's, it's always composition first for me um uh, of course all the other elements have to come into play the energy and, and the actual execution of the technique but i'm always leading the composition yeah very cool. So you uh you did uh you did some films, I believe, up in Seattle with Bao Tran. Uh yeah. and uh one of the ones that um that stands out in, in my memory is Bookie because I mm. thought that it was such a unique it was such a unique indie action film. Mm -hmm. It was black and white, heavy on acting, uh lighter on like the big shapes and the big Hong Kong style. 
and it always stood out to me uh just talk about like you know was that your first film with bow i think you did carmen's virtue before that we did carmen's bow. virtue yeah yeah so, yeah so i mean again like when you start attracting or you start getting interested in these things you start to see uh a lot of the familiar faces pop up and names uh handles and stuff pop up in forms and whatnot and um but bow was actually introduced to us through a family friend and um we he he made a film in high school um just his own his own version of uh his own stunt blade alpha his own title pending to say it was called dragons never die and it was a really really cool um little short film that uh that got put in front of us and um i knew that i had to reach out to this dude because he it looked like he had a different sort of take on storytelling and action and that's what attracted me to bow's work um even as far back as you know uh, dragons never die and even working on Carmen's virtue with him his his approach to directing action or um directing the film around action was a little bit different than i was used to because it was story forward um and that kind of that is what i knew i was getting into with bookie because i knew even though i had aaron tony which was an amazing athletically gifted super talented martial artist and sam Locke, who i worked with before and i've proven that we could do some really cool stuff he didn't want to have anything to do with that if it didn't serve the story and it didn't serve the character. It didn't serve any of those kind of details, those, those very specific details in storytelling and, and kind of Bao's strong approach to story. Um, so I knew what I was getting into with him. Um, and when it came to the choreography, it was it was ultimately about being honest in the situation, moment to moment. Like there is something different to me. And I carry that on to everything I've done um, yeah, after Bookie uh, is the way that I approach the intentions behind movement is all rooted in kind of like collaborating with Bao is really understanding story, really understanding character and, and putting that forward um, as the driving motivator for, for movement and violence. Yeah. Um, it's a very violent scene. Um, one of the more violent scenes that I've ever done. And it, and, and it pales in comparison in terms of the, the movement count um, and just kind of the complexity of things, but there was so much more going on emotionally. And that's what I really loved about watching the result of it. I was like, you know, we're doing a, doing a handful of things, but the way that we were able to kind of express the emotion and the, and the sort of tr trauma behind everything that was happening in that, in that short 30 second exchange or whatever that was, was felt so real to me. And it was an easier, it was actually easier to perform. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, there's there's something about that formula um and and working with bow just having a really good director take care of the story and sort of guide your movements in that way versus being so caught up in the spectacle you know absolutely so, yeah so after after bookie uh mm -hmm. you have this sort of new you have this sort of new take on how to do action mm -hmm. uh did challenger come the challenger Ooh, come yeah. after uh, bookie the challenger came after bookie that was uh in 2015 i believe 15 16. yeah um i would i would also i would highly recommend everybody go watch that short right now thanks man. yeah ken at uh one of his finest moments thank you that that short was um it's still one of my it's still one of the top just creatively, just the collaboration around that, the team that worked with, and it was a small team, um, but just the way that it came out it couldn't have been any better. And for, for my own performance and just kind of like the way that it was shot, the, the cinematographer had never shot um, action before. Um, it was just a really cool team of people that understood what we were trying to do, um, and it, which was basically trying to make a down and dirty, hardcore looking, Kung Fu fight, which is a little different than, you know, what I think people were used to because, um, you know, when you do work on shapes, it's a really perfectly postured lines are nice and straight, but there was an aggression and a style and, a, and, a, and kind of an emotion behind the movements that I think was a little different than what people were used to seeing at that time. Um, and maybe even to this day, I think, um, I'd love to see more of that style of action, um, using traditional movements uh, i think that's a fascinating way to like the, you know discover new movements um through those types of those older patterns and seeing how that works in a re in a real life setting 
you know, we tried to make it feel as real as possible. Um, I think one of the, th the things that we kept saying was like, we wanted, we wanted to do Shaw Brothers in a street fight. Like what that, what would that look like? I mean, the rhythm is broken, but you're still trying to maintain technique. I mean, you're still trying to do your Sifu proud, but like, you know, like how that all breaks down and how that um, kind of evolves over the course of, you know, uh, an action sequence. So Yeah, there, there's not, um, it doesn't seem like you're really solving problems with editing in that. It seems like a lot of, like when you're talking about characters, you know, because like, yeah. That is kind of like an easy way to solve problems yeah. if you don't mm -hmm. have time to, you know, right. like, you know, you can't do right. your master properly. It's all right, we'll just cut off the end. We'll just shoot. And that was like the Corey Yoon and Samo style that we all learned, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but that can also be a temptation to not solve the problems in the choreo, which is what Correct. Jackie would do, right? Like Jackie would just let it sit. He's like Chaplin, right. where if I can't solve the problem in this take, I do another take. Yes, so you're, are, did you approach, you know, action design uh, from a framing perspective in that sense? This is that one time where I, I, I relinquished that. I could, did not hold on to the framing of this, of this film. I just focused on the emotion of Andy and myself and how that conversation would sort of climax into what it did. I really stepped back. I gave all the reins to the cinematographer and bow to kind of figure out where the tension needs to build, where we need to emphasize all that stuff. I gave, you know, my best recommendation for what I understood to be the best, you know, um, kind of uh, being in that headspace, but um, of, of doing the action, it felt so much better to just let it go and, and let the team take care of it. Cause then I could just focus on performance versus worrying about knowing the camera is being, I'm framing, I'm being framed this way. Cause then I get a little bit too in my head about looking good versus performing well. Uh, I don't know if that, that kind of makes sense. It's a it's a very nuanced thing, but when you're ripping through choreography and, and pouring your heart out into movement, it's very different than knowing where the camera is and kind of worrying about like is your shoulder blocking, you know, the incoming stack, right? Like there's little things that you kind of calculate and things happen at split second speed. But with that, I was able to just pour it all out. And I think that's that was the difference that I saw in my own performance. And then even with Andy, um, it was a little different for him to kind of fall, which was a good thing it was intended, but to fall apart at the end of certain segments because I, it was like, I don't want you to look crisp and clean. I think you need to break down. It needs, I need to show that I broke your guard. I need to show that I'm in your head. I need to show that your stance work, you're getting flustered and, and you're, you know, this is a, you know, I'm putting you in a, in a, you know, in a pressure cooker right now. Like all these kinds of emotions is trying to draw out of the both of us. And um, having, having the ability to focus on performance versus the technical side of, of filmmaking was, was game changer for me. And um, that I, I, I think for me, it's sort of, and then kind of moves into paper tigers but for me, it made me really, really believe in um, being a little bit more hyper-focused on which side of the, uh, of the camera you are. If I was, if I was shooting stuff for, you know, later for paper tigers, I was completely focused on trying to get, my actors to give the emotion and give the movement, give the energy that I wanted because I knew what the framing was look like, looking like versus being the performer, you kind of just let everything go and you just respond. You know, we know, we know what the lines are, right? The, the physical lines, we know what the, the descriptions are gonna be and how Andy's gonna come at me. But um, it was so, it was so uh, liberating to just perform and not worry about the technical side, so. Yeah, there's kind of like a, a little bit of like what what like choreographed mess, I guess you could say, where yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. like choreographed slop is kind of stuff that like Donnie N was mm -hmm. playing with Flashpoint, mm -hmm. and right. uh, which I think people don't realize is incredibly difficult because. So, um, um, did you have any particular moments where, you know, you realize like, oh man, this is tough, like because it is a different kind of movement style, right? It different is, kind of choreography style. It is. It, it's that. And also, I, you know, that was the first time I worked with Andy. But it was funny because Bao, when we were doing some playbacks and, and, you know, even discussing certain takes, he would pick a sloppier take. And I'm like, no, don't do this to me. Like, <laughs> my, my lines were perfect in this one. He was like, but where are we in the fight? You know, and then he'd always put this kind of story points in front of me and we're like, where what's the truth in this like would you be perfectly postured in this and you know like you know what how would you be how would your structure be at this point if andy had 
kind of the turn, tides have turned and where are you now mentally? And so it was, it was a lot of stuff like that. And that was really, really fun to kind of get into that kind of mindset, a creative mindset during the edit um, and seeing the efficacy of like choosing, a, you know, a sloppier take. It told the story better. And, and I'll, you know, I, I use that to this day, just kind of like really considering like where we are in the story, even if it's the fight sequence is 10 seconds long, it's like, where does that last posture end up and why, why does it look the way it does? So it's really asking you the why a lot, you know, and that was one thing that he always, uh, working with Bali always pushes that on you. Like, mm -hmm. what, what do you, what, where are we at? Where are we at in the story? Even if it's, like I said, even if it's just a five, 10 second segment. So kind of feels, that stuff kind of feels really Korean in that way. Kind of feels Korean. Yeah. 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 You see but Donnie you see, too, you know, yeah, like trend. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, uh, I did watch quite a bit of like, even though the style is very different, but like even like Flashpoint and watching how all that felt so natural and raw. And I knew that was something that we were going for with the Challenger is that rawness that like live and direct, like this is happening right now. It's not a polished thing. It's, it's just like these two dudes are trying to hurt each other. And you start to mature into the, that kind of mindset when you're creating, you know, you're doing you know, action design and you kind of abandon some of that. Uh, you know, um, how do you say this? The fascination with everything being perfect and clean. I do. Crisp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, that was a huge learning experience for me, and and it's kind of evolved my approach and just like how I look at action, even other people's action and things that um, you know I look for and I appreciate and, and action design today and big Hollywood stuff or even independent stuff like. I, I really appreciate when they apply that realism and, um, you know, just being honest to the story. Yeah. So you, um, you did paper tigers and in that one, you are, um, you're the villain in that one, uh, yeah. a very formidable, much Dang. younger, more ripped character than the, the three main characters. And you are yeah. also, you're also, you know, doing action for, uh, characters who have flaws right so what is what's your starting point for that kind of action yeah i mean again it, it goes back to really doing character study and trying to build these stories trying to build these reasons as to why these movements look the way they do and, and what happened it's like coming up with little fun little trivia about king or you know ron yuan's character or or why danny uh, chooses to it's really really nuanced stuff but why he chooses to kick with his right leg something happened but it never it will never be told to the audience that like in my head as his action designer danny had um an accident uh playing tennis and now like it's i like doing that i like building these worlds behind the character behind the movements and that just gives more reason and more it gives me more um uh there's more to grab onto and grasp onto and to different perspectives to, to look at when i'm composing you know, the choreography, because, you know, when I look at the movements, they're very simple movements, but the one thing that I always told them, uh, told the actors is that uh, it's not, it's not the, it's not the move, it's the groove, it's, it's what you're feeling in that moment, right? And that was one thing that I was like, forget about the flashy stuff, forget about all that. Remember, you're trying to win. Like, that's, that's the ultimate, that's why we're here in this pool right now. You're trying to spank these, these kids, you know, like you're trying to put it on them. You're trying to let them know that you're the boss. Um, so building these little stories behind each of the characters was, was that, that was hugely important to, to me. And it was also like parallel to how, how, um, how adamant Bao was about, um, pushing story first, you know, in all the movements. So, um, there's a uh, there's a shot I think it's where Ron I think he throws a spin kick and he just flat backs. Yeah. Yes. See was that, that was an a moment. Accident? No. Well, <laughs> I guess we'll say no now. Okay. We'll just say no. That's fine. <laughs> but let's We know let you me, meant let me it, just, Ron. We know he, yeah. That was actually a brilliant um decision on Ron's part because that spin was that kick was not part of the choreography. And he was just like, he kept saying to us, and this is, this is part of that discussion between actors and, and the design team and, and Bao about like, look, Ron's character has a huge ego. He's obviously broken. Um, he's not going to let this kid win, even if it means he's going to throw his body at him. And that was, that was a creative decision that Ron made to be like, look, if I was this dude, if I was Hing, I would 
I would, you know, I would throw my body at this guy and I would just do anything to win. And that's kind of that develop that, that evolves into the, that kind of the last segment of him, you know, spanking him and doing, um, uh, less honorable acts, you know, in a Bamo match. Um, so that was, that was one of those things where we were just discovering on, on, in the moment, um, paying attention again, paying attention to the story. Um, when you're in the moment and putting the choreography together, you can cut your adrenaline's running. You're like, now I would do this. Now I would do, I would do it like this. And so it was, it was really having that open forum to have discussions about the movements as we were working through the, the already set choreography. I was always open to things changing if they felt a certain way, as long as it followed the structure of the story, the arc of each of the, each of the segments. So, um, Hugely collaborative effort um, on all the choreography um, from the Paper Tigers. I know I'm touted as you know the action designer of that film, but I I always like if I have an opportunity to just make sure that everybody knows that all the actors, all the, anybody in this in the in the action side had had input on the on the choreography and the, and the design of the movie, um, and I think it came out in a way that felt a little bit more authentic. Um, it didn't look like me applying my style, my body style, my movements to these these men. It was them in the way that their bodies reacted and responded to um, a set of movements, you know, a set of movements, a style that was, you know, rooted in a family style, but ultimately became what they turned it into. It became their expression of the stuff that I was teaching them. So and ultimately that's, you know, that's kind of what martial arts is, right? It's like expressing all those tools, all that, that entire palette and expressing what it is that you know, whatever your truth is in that moment, you know, being not being too philosophical, but it was it was really allowing the, the actors to take what, you know, we put down on paper. And then how do you interpret it? How do you improv off of these off of this structure? And give me something different. What do you think the hardest part of Paper Tigers was? Yeah, I, I think it's a it's kind of a technical thing, but it's it's more along the lines of the three main tigers came from such different movement backgrounds and trying to align them to make it seem like they came from the same system was a very difficult thing for me to do. And it was trying to find those common movements that, that you not, not, it wasn't anything specific. I didn't want it to be like a hand form that they all did, but it was just a style that they moved, like what linear patterns they would move. Again, even if the audience doesn't pick up on these things, it was for me to feel confident in how I was building the action. Um, but yeah, I mean, Mikel can't comes from a boxing background. He's just a naturally gifted and athletic guy. Um, how do you get him to make, make it seem like he forgot Kung Fu, but it's still back in there. It's in his head somewhere. Um, Danny, um, Elaine, he has a Taekwondo background, but like, how do you make it seem like he was once the most formidable dude in, in all of, you know, Seattle or wherever, you know, um, and same with Ron, Ron was, Ron's well, seasoned screen fighter, but how do you make him look broken, but still rooted in the system, right? Like there are a lot of questions to be asked um, during the during, during um, the build process of the action design, and um, I think the more questions you you allow yourself to ask, um, the more confident you become in the story you're telling. If that makes sense, like because because then I feel like I've, I'm covering more bases, and, and I'm I'm taking all the questions away from the audience, so they could just sit back and believe. Right. So I'm doing the work for you guys. So you guys don't have to like, hey, how come Ron did this thing and Danny looks different over here and Mikel's, you know, doing a different thing over here. And um, whether or not that's a reaction I got um, from anybody, um, it was always the intent to, to make it seem like they were all aligned, it came from the same, same garage, same paint cans, same seafood, same everything. So, yeah, that was a challenge. That was a challenge. I think it worked, man. That movie, uh, <laughs> a lot of people talk about that movie. So oh, uh, you did something right. Still um, bored. Yeah, um, yeah, nice job. Um, I skipped over a, a small episode. Uh, I guess it's not that small. Uh, you did some stuff with Dennis Rule. Uh, well, you did Rope It Up too with Dennis Rule, but that was uh, that was unfortunately I couldn't I couldn't employ your full talents for that one. Oh, because, that's okay uh you yeah no you know the deal people can watch um, it but you you did uh rival grocer grocers with dennis and you did unlucky stars too you started unlucky stars and yeah dennis is one of my absolute all-time favorite collaborators you know it's one of the most talented 
martial artists and just all around good dudes. Um, he's got an amazing energy um, in front of and behind the camera. Um, so yeah, like working with Dennis over the years, I, I met Dennis um, through Facebook, just kind of bopping around, like watching a couple of things. I think Vlad was posting some, some stuff and I saw Dennis was a part of it. And then I also, I also knew Dennis from, um, uh, from Contour. Um, and I was like, dude, this guy's, so he's the white Ken Lo. Like he's, he's got it all. The way you guys shot him in Contour, the way you responded to his kicking styles, it was just like, I have to know this guy. I don't care working with him. I just got to know who this dude is. So I'm, I'm very grateful for, for all the projects that I worked on with, with Dennis. Um, we, def we definitely were able to bring our A-games out for each other. Um, yeah, we did Rival Grocers. Um, we did a short kind of a sort of responding to the fascination with MMA and MMA choreography. And it was called, uh, it was a short called Bloody Sun by Vlad. Um, that was, that was a real fun one. And that was, again, that was kind of going back to like a little bit more, uh, starting to tell the truth, um, behind, you know, the trauma and behind the violence. Um, so that was fun to start to start to act, you know, start to begin to act you know, action act versus just doing movements in front of the camera. Um, and he was, a, he's a, he's a great actor himself. So it was really fun to, to kind of, uh, you know, improv with him and build choreography. So, um, yeah, and then eventually we we decided that the next best thing is to, to to pour all of our life and energy into a in an independent feature film, and that's how we uh, we spent a good, gosh, I don't know, it was like four or five years on and off making um, Unlucky Stars, which to this day still is like I can't believe we finished because it was so difficult to 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 get people to coordinate, and I was only available on weekends, and you know, like Sam Hargrave was in it. Um, you know, he's out shooting Marvel movies and he would come home for like a week and we'd have a snap of him for a couple of scenes that we needed to pick up. And it's amazing the, uh, the, the, uh, the commitment and the tenacity that Dave and Vlad, uh, or Dave, um, Dennis and Vlad put, to, put into that film because um, it's kind of a, a bit of a who's who, um, aside from not having you in there, it was, it's a bit of a who's who on the in, in the, in the action scene, you know, like, you got Sean Bernal, you got Manny Manzanares, you got um, Roy Chen, Ed Kahana. Who else is in there? Marshall uh, Club. <laughs> Marshall Club's in there. Yeah, we got the Marshall Club when they were babies. I mean, Brian yeah. was like half the size he is now yeah. in that film. Yeah. So it was a really, a really amazing um, piece to be part of because because of all the just the good intentions. Everybody was so like down to 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 partake, and, and we all knew what we were doing. We just a love letter to Hong Kong action cinema the best way we could with the, the little amount of money that we had. So to this day, still some of my favorite on set memories is being with those guys, cracking jokes and, you know, working through, working through the, uh, the shot list, you know? Yeah. For anybody who doesn't know, doing an indie action feature with basically no money, um, it's very difficult. So be careful be careful, be careful, be careful what careful. you wish for if you, if you set out to do on it. a limb yeah. If you yeah. Set, yeah, yeah if you step out on a limb and you decide to do that uh yeah but then the payoff is uh the payoff is usually not monetary it's usually, <laughs> it's, not <at> all. <laughs> it's usually very uh it's you form you've gone through a war you've gone through a war you guys went through a five, a five year war to do that movie so kudos mm -hmm. to you Yes, thank you. Special group of guys. Special and Dennis, special you know, guys. like I, I know him. He's just a soldier, man. I remember, like, you know, I was doing Death Grip at the time, and uh -huh. and you know, I was, I was like, he. That's why he's not in Death Grip. He's doing. Uh, oh, you were doing Death Grip while we were shooting. Yeah, same. Yeah, same deal. You know, right, and Death right, Grip. Right. I mean, it was kind of the opposite, right? Where like we had like, I mean relatively speaking we had far less time we had two months to do that movie because you know just that was just the production model that we had right so it just uh and then i was editing it for the rest of my life <laughs> obviously it's the editing man you yeah. think you know you're done shooting and you're like okay the movie's made and that is the furthest from the truth like it's sort of done it's so daunting once you get in the, into post you're just like jesus like now now we have to put it together and now luckily dennis was kind of cutting as we were moving you know during the five years you know like he was always piecing it together and we were putting segments together and finding out you know where the story holes were and, and, and you know, anything we could improve if we had an opportunity to we would um but yeah i mean 
just I just remember a couple of phone calls with him during the editing process. Just like it was almost it, it was, some, some days it felt like we weren't going to do it. And then there were other days where it was just like we were high fiving you know, over just like looking at clips together and being like, we have to finish. Like we have to publish this. Or this has to get out there. Just for our own good. Um, it was just so creatively rewarding to be surrounded with, you know, by guys like that. You know, lest we yeah. forget, you know, Vlad choreographed the whole thing and, and being being under his guidance and and kind of being part of his vision was just like, you know, that was that was a huge experience for me because he's got a very very specific way of articulating movement and how he expects things to look and rhythm and all that. And I learned a great deal from him too. So, yeah, Vlad and Dennis were. Um, that was it was a really really great team to be part of um despite it taking as long as it did it was, just, yeah. no, it, was a, it was a cool process yeah um you know i wanted to uh to get your thought about what you think the audience can actually see right because you have these you have these nuanced moments you know kubrick will put a bunch of symbolism into his movies right Mm -hmm. uh, and, you'll, and you'll get these analyses where people talk about you know like the analyses are so in depth they're longer than the movies a lot of the time yeah um and there's probably an argument to be made that the audience sees that stuff they just might mm -hmm. not know it um like and i call it your scoring points the audience mm -hmm. doesn't know why doesn't know mm -hmm. why they like this sometimes and maybe like you were saying you're just trying to take the work the work away from them so they don't have to like think too much about it mm -hmm, and at the mm -hmm. same time like the more you do that it's sort of like the more they trust yeah the, the film so right. um yeah how like how do you like at what point you know whether it's paper tigers or whatever it might be at what point do you say okay i don't need to go any deeper than this they're just not going to see it right is there a way that you gauge that gosh i feel like the answer is yes because because of how i do when i when I edit movements on the day, um, sometimes I'll simplify things because I'm like, that doesn't, that doesn't do anything for the audience. That's not going to help them understand the situation that we're in anymore. Um, on top of that, my actor's not getting the movement right. Um, I'm not getting the movement right. It's just not translating um, and, and, and uh, giving emphasis to any part of the story. Um, I know I always re refer back to that, but it's so important for me to make sure that everything Every every movement is is truth is is really trying to give the audience a consistent beating of like these movements aren't just spectacle. We're trying to get from point A to point B, and as long as I can clean that up and streamline that streamline that as much as possible while sprinkling in some some beauty, uh, I think I did my job right. Um, and I think it takes a lot of discipline because, it, you know, especially being surrounded by the talent that we have access to, dude, like we have some really amazing friends and we can go out and shoot a, an amazing fight scene tomorrow if we wanted to. But uh, I always go, I always think to myself, why will people care? Why will people care this guy got punched in the face? Like, why will people care that, you know, this, these, this hand is going up this way? Like, what is the death finger? You know, like, are, is the audience now believing in the death thing or, you know, the death touch or whatever it is that, that we're working on or whatever the emotion is behind the impact. Like it's all those little things. It's all those, it's all those little story points that build into giving the audience the information that they need to get from A to B. Cause one of the things I remember, even with the paper tigers and um, Val was, Val kept saying like, yes, we're making this film, you know, you're doing the action design. So that it's something that we're proud of as people that, you know, we, we came from this and this is kind of where we, Kind of entered you know the, the realm of filmmaking from and we have a great appreciation for movement and action design but it was ultimately about like whatever you do your auntie has to understand the fight scene too your grandma has to understand the fight scene too let's let's level the playing field and give everybody access to this 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 style of storytelling that way uh it's more of a consensus and everybody has a great time and it's not like you know like your your wife or your 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 auntie's looking over at you like what happened like, why is he holding his nose? I don't understand. It was like, I heard a bunch of noises and now he's holding his nose. It's like, give her the tools to understand the, the you know, why now and the next thing Danny has a tissue up his nose or something or whatever it is, or why now, um, just the way that the, just the way that action is structured, I always feel better knowing that everybody understands what's going on. And that kind of goes back to just 
my approach to design is being as clear as possible and giving, giving, you know, giving that, giving everybody an even playing field when it comes to understanding what's being displayed on screen. Like, yeah, what's the why? Like, why, why are these guys punching each other in the face? Like, what? Why is one guy running? Why is Jackie running? Why does Jackie not have any clothes on right now? Like, how did we get here? You know, like, it's fun to watch those fight scenes because he does build story into all of his movements and. That's why I'm to this day, he's still the master to me. He's still the almighty, like look back at all this stuff. I'm like, you did it. Perfect. That was perfect. Project day. Perfect. I you know, like perfect. Everything that I've seen in, that uh, Jackie do, I just, I still go back and I go, we're not going to see another one of these in, for, you know, for a long time if, if in my life, <laughs> but like, I'm so happy to have come across it's this funny. material. It's funny. You mentioned, you know, auntie and grandma enjoying Mm -hmm. your movies because uh i used to test out whether action scenes worked with my mom my mom knows nothing about action scenes yeah but i knew that if, i knew that if she was following it uh and if she was like laughing at the key moments then i yes. then i was then i wasn't then i wasn't going for like this like purely hong kong style whatever right i was doing mm -hmm. something that hit home mm -hmm. and uh was that is that something like did you show your movies to your family and did you have experiences like that or i think you know i did you test with honestly like i knew that was something that we said even go, before go, as we were going through production right um uh pre and uh pre and and shooting like i knew that when we were developing the action that was something that i kept in the back of my head but i knew we succeeded when <clears throat> i would get messages whether it was facebook or just my father telling me that my my aunt and cousins watched the film over the weekend and they thought it was amazing and the, the action was so good and to me that's that's the proof that was like that we did the job right we did what we needed to do and um i actually got more uh positive feedback from from that type of a crowd versus the indie or not the indie but just that straight action you know uh lovers crowd right like more people um in the general pop if you would like were more positively responsive to paper tigers than a hardcore like you know like just library of knowledge and all you know like the stuff that we grew up watching we're very critical of everything we watch and try to piece it together and we have a different level of appreciation for movement and, and action design but i knew that we did something right when i was getting that kind of feedback from family and, and friends of family and um people that aren't martial artists or they just like a good movie on a Saturday night. And I was like, okay, this is, I got to do that again. Like the next time I, I get presented with an opportunity to design action is just to keep those kinds of things in mind. Of course, every project is different. Every audience that you're aiming at is different. But I knew that with Bao's movie, it was something where he wanted to reach a broader audience and it wasn't made for us. And, you know, as hard as that is to admit to myself, I, the action wasn't designed for us, you and me, Eric. It wasn't designed for us to be like, oh, I know where this is coming. I know where this is all rooted from. It was to entertain, you know, a, a broader audience and to get everybody in on um, being excited about Kung Fu in action. <laughs> I mean, I would say that people like me uh, and our contemporaries and our, you know, Hong Kong film nut fans have something, have something to learn here, which is that um, the average person might not want that like purely strictly hong kong perfect shapely you know movement yeah. style whatever it might be uh and that maybe you know we might be out of touch sometimes and understanding the audience you know i mean especially since you're 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 doing a comedy mm -hmm. uh it stars characters who are getting old right mm -hmm. they're people um that if we look at that purely through the lens of like well that the movements aren't really to my liking or whatever it might be then well i mean i don't know maybe we're the ones out of touch you know mm. sometimes yeah you, you wonder like and i think that's an important thing to get be in touch with is who you're aiming your product to you know like just who this is for who who, who are you just so, you know unlucky stars was for us that was for us to be like oh i know like that's from twinkle twinkle or you know, we're ref referring to um, some very, very um, iconic things. And it, it's a it's a treasure hunt for us to watch and to be, you know, to really appreciate stuff that Vlad put together. But 
something like Paper Tigers is the action is secondary. It's supporting the story and instead of being the primary driving force in the story. So that was a huge thing for me to remain disciplined with because again, you know, even having a fight scene, even having, you know, Philip Dang and Andy Lay and uh, Brian Lay on set and just to, to give them enough to display their skills, but also make sure that I'm disciplined and I don't just let them go off and do everything that, you know, that they're used to doing. It's kind of like meeting them halfway and like, hey, uh, I, you're here because of, you do that, but also meet me halfway and help me tell the story of each of these, each of these fight sequences. And they were great at, you know, at all of that, so. Yeah. What's stopping you from dipping your toe into Hollywood? Dipping my toe into Hollywood, oh, gosh, I mean, I, I do enjoy my day job. <laughs> I'm, I'm a full-time uh, designer. Um, I, I, I've been at, uh, at Apple for about 15 years now, and I really enjoy my job. I really do, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And I met a lot of people, and, um, you know, like that's a full-time job, and it's taken a lot of time um, away from pursuing, say, being a screenwriter or a stuntman. Um, if that life is so different than sitting down at your desk and being creative in, in kind of a visual design kind of a sense, Whereas like, you know, being a top level performer or, or a performer that just doesn't get hurt, you have to be training all the time. You have to be in the gym, you have to be learning and, and, and participating in new forms and new ways of action, understanding action design. And um, so it's ultimately been a time constraint thing and, 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 a, and a, um, a split in interests. Um, while I am still completely in love with filmmaking and design and action design and, and performing action, there's still a side of me that loves loves my loves my um, my job as a as a visual artist and as a creative director. So that that life that that ability to tell story in a different manner, it still it still kind of feels the same because you know when you're making films, on, what are you doing? We're telling stories, right? Even in action design, we're telling segments of a story. Um, and with design, I still feel like I have access to doing that. So I don't feel like I'm losing that part of my craft. Um, now I can't. I don't know that I can still um, move as well as I did in, you know, when I was a little bit younger, but um, I still have that in me. And I still have that, that energy in me to like, to pursue smaller projects, um, to keep, to keep active. You know, like if Dennis called me tomorrow, and was like, Hey, we're, I got funding for, <laughs> for Unlucky Stars part two, like, tell me when I'll put in my vacation time and we'll make it happen. You know what I mean, I'm that, I'm that kind of guy where, Val will call me and be like, we're making the Paper Tigers this summer. Are you still available? Kind of thing. You better be. And we make it happen. So I've just been blessed with being able to have that type of privilege and flexibility at work. Um, and, uh, you know, working working with people that know that other side of my my creativity, they're, they, they're very much um, uh, supportive and willing to kind of push me in that direction. Because it is, it is a, it's, it's an interesting thing um, to, to, to watch a friend go through the process of building a movie with friends that he's known for, since high school. And so that's kind of been my story, um, with, with, uh, my current team is like, they know I'm, I'm deeply rooted in, um, martial arts and filmmaking and all that before I was a graphic designer. So it's more true to me than it is, you know, the stuff I do on a Mac. <laughs> so. I'm uh I I am trying to put together a rope dope three. It's logistically a nightmare, but I think if if it happens, you are the villain in it. Oh my you gosh. are the bad guy. So uh, I, I, I want to do it, and I'm just trying. I will to start stretching it. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I will no, start play an old, right? play an old broken kung fu master. Oh, that'd be fun too, though. <laughs> that'd be actually even more well, fun. Because because I'm gonna have a beard. Dennis is gonna you know we'll make Dennis yeah. like. More- and put some gray. I got in. a little gray. I got a little gray. You know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We'll make it look. We'll make it you look still look gray. Anyway, I'll have to hold you up a little bit. I don't need any makeup for that. For that oh stuff. man, um, that'd be so much fun, man. I I would I would jump at that <laughs> opportunity. Like no no question. When you watch action films today, what do you look at? What are you looking for? Honestly, I'm looking for. Like this is a new thing, and I've, I, I'm telling myself to look for this. Uh, it's, it's a great question because I've, I've been doing this lately. Is trying to really pay attention um, behind the emotional, the emotional charge behind the performer. Um, there's this, there's a scene, there's a, a Mission Impossible fight scene um, in a bathroom that I think is rip roaring, so good to me. To me, I, I've gotten, 
I've definitely had gotten into some heated debates of whether or not like that is a good action scene or not. But to me, uh, that is the bathroom scene in the Mission Impossible. Um, some of the, even some of the uh, exchanges in the James Bond movie. When an actor that really understands his character applies movement, aggression, and emotion behind the movement, um, it just feels better. It feels different. It feels there's so much more. It's it's so much more. Uh, richness to it and um it could be a haymaker but the way tom cruise or henry cavill throws the haymaker makes a big difference to me and i can feel that emotion i can feel the intention a little bit more and that is what i look for even if it's a training segment like something in dune you know there's a that that the training segment with um what's his name Berlin and um timothy chalamet the rhythm and the lesson that his instructor is teaching him, there's so much more applied to it than just some Kali movements. There's the way that they're applying the movements, the the rhythm, the conversation that they're having. When it's done in that way, um, I'm just taking it back and I'm inspired all over again. I'm inspired all over again. And the thing I've done is I've actually taken that mentality and I've gone back to like 1985 or 1983 and watched Wheels on Mills and I watched Benny and Jackie go at it. I'm like, they were doing it. They were doing it. And that's what I, that's what moved me back then. I may not have known it. I may have thought it was that rolling kip up and then knocking, you know, blowing the candles out with a kick, all those spectacle things. It's not, it wasn't, I don't think it was. I think it was the way that they performed, the energy that they poured, that they put, the emotion they put. Bruce, he's got charisma in everything he does. So it really comes back to telling the story. It really comes back to understanding the character's motivations and I know that sounds like actor studio type stuff, but man, it really is effective for me as a viewing, as a viewer. Um, and that's kind of my, that's my number one thing when I watch action. I don't care if it's Jason Momoa or Jackie Chan. Like I want to see like how, like how well you perform, you know, uh, your movements with the emotional content and then the aggression and, and the understanding of the moment. That to me is what, is what uh, is inspiring and kind of keeps me, peaking like okay let's see the action and everything everywhere right all at once like that action was supposed to be a colorful alternate universe type of a play on on martial arts and they succeeded and and you know it was fun and so they checked the box for me and i applaud that you know like that's what i'm looking for those kinds of things the emotional backing um i think that will always be the number one for me i was gonna ask you um where you would like the action scene to go. But maybe a better question is what advice would you give to up and coming indie action designers who want to better their craft? Uh, what would you tell them? I would I would tell indie action designers to focus on your stories, focus on what you're trying to get across in terms of, you know, like why are you putting the short together? If it's a short fight scene, Still, come up with some, come up with a backstory for why these guys are throwing chairs at each other. Like, what's the point of all of this? It'll help you root. It'll help you stay uh, more truthful to what you're doing. It'll keep you on track. It'll keep you in the realm that you started from, if that makes sense. Like, sometimes you can, you, you can see some fight scenes. They start off a certain way and they end up somewhere else with like a knife in the hand and they're swinging swords around like, usha, and you're like, I how do we end up here? Like just a second ago, you know, you're grappling and it was raw and dirty. And thumbs are going in the eye and now we're, everything's pretty because we're in the rain. Uh, I don't know. That's totally made up, but I'm just saying like, it, 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 it forces you to be a little bit more disciplined and through that discipline, you get an opportunity to be a little bit more creative, I think, because you're taking care of the foundation of what, what all this is sitting on, when all that's tight, then you can start to be a little bit more creative, which sounds a little backwards, but but I feel like um, you know being driven by being led by story, really understanding the character motivations is 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 will always kind of be the core of um, what I think of quality action design um, sequences. So that would be my biggest advice: understand what these guys are doing. Don't just put some moves together. Everybody wants to look cool and head snap and look tall and proud and big chested at the end with a, with a sword over the shoulder, like, but not all characters get to end up that way. You know, you know, it's just like, let's tell some truths. Let's, let's make it real. And, um, I Sometimes think it's, getting it's more old fun. Sometimes getting old. <laughs> yeah. It's natural. It's natural. Yeah. 
Oh man, I, I, I don't know if I could go through another, you know, I just I think it back to like title pending too, like how we were just falling on concrete and like take after take because we didn't understand, you know, how to structure a day. You know, like you're just out there shooting. You're just like, okay, today we're gonna mess with the shopping cart <laughs> and then see where this fits into the whole thing. And you're like, okay, this is this is filmmaking. You learn, you know, you learn, you know, you, you learn to be more efficient. You learn why you're doing things you're doing. And um that way you can make more so you don't get broken after one. You know, you pour it all into one, like then you're done. But um I don't know. But that's kind of that's kind of my take on on um um, if I were to get advice, um, you know, early on in my, my endeavor, it would be to focus on that kind of stuff. Like really, really, really hone in on those details and, and breathe some life into these characters. The movements will be way more colorful. Yeah. Sage advice. Thank you. Um, Ken, I think you're one of the best out there. Uh, oh man, that's a huge and, uh, thing here, dude. So well, look, uh, I, doing the stunt stunt people thing back in '01. You know, we we're like a bunch of rednecks up in Northern California, and I saw you guys, and I just thought, like, dang, like that's our competition. What the hell? I didn't even know how to do martial arts back then. I was just a programmer. So yeah, man, you know, I've been a big fan for uh, a long time now. So I can't wait to see what you do next, and I hope that uh, one of those things is my thing that uh, I can bring I, you. I, Oh. 100% don't even it, it is it is a yes before you even ask um I get yeah man I I'm I'm a huge fan Eric like I I, I was even telling my wife I was like Sarah Eric I'm gonna do a podcast with Eric you know Eric because she's seen you know we've been together for 20 years so she's seen me download all these videos over the years so she knows your face and it's yeah. it's really cool to um have an opportunity to talk with you I'm a huge fan I think you're the you and I would say Andy Long are the closest thing to I've ever seen to performing anywhere near the quality and skill and the and the rhythm of Jackie and the Hong Kong style. I I I, I really do believe that. Um, I give you that from me to you as like well, definitely look, one of the. <laughs> you guys were the you guys you guys lit a flame under my butt for sure oh, like man. really hardcore um so it's mutual um i'm hoping to talk to more zero gravity guys also um please and, do uh, man those, yeah. those guys are they got some they, they probably have some stories um you know yeah. even, even before my time so it's an interesting group of guys that, that yeah. found each other back in the day so uh, yeah, it was great, great to be part of that come up with you and, and the rest of the guys and you know, yeah. through the message boards everybody motivating each other so i couldn't be happier to be part of that era like it's a really yeah, cool group of guys you know? <laughs> yeah. for sure well congrats to you guys and um i think you've you know you've proven yourself uh in films and uh while be having a very successful career in graphics which i think i think it only helps you well, that would be my yeah. personal take. So, um, yeah. you know, I'm, uh, so Ken, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you. it's been, uh, it's been lovely, man. I can't wait to see what you guys do next. And thanks, man. I appreciate you including me yeah. in, these, in, in this chat. So yeah. Thanks. All man. Right, man. Yeah. Action Talks is available on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify. Join my telegram at t.me slash Eric Jacobus. You can check out my studio at superalloyinteractive.com. My website and blog is at ericjacobus.com. And be sure to subscribe. Thank you.